Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today um, in this evening. Um, you can grab anything for, for drinks, stuff like that, and I will go ahead and give you guys a 30 minutes to 45 minutes presentation on um, an introduction into English law. And this will follow by the so different sources of law that uh, English law follows. And I would also like to talk about or share with you about um, the two different areas of law, mainly tort law and constitutional rights, being public law and private law uh, specifically. And I will introduce you guys to the case of that and hurt or if you guys have followed this case throughout the entire series um, you guys might have an idea but i will talk about what is defamation and the um the english law on uh, defamation law in terms of english law i will also talk about different elements of a defamation claim followed by a problem question where you will get to apply your knowledge of a defamation of a defamation law in the English legal system. And hopefully you guys will enjoy this presentation. And I will finish off the presentation by sharing with you about my experience of being a law student in the UK at Bristol. And if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to ask any of your questions during the Q&A sessions later. So different countries usually have different legal system. Um, but there are two broad categories of legal system in this slide. And the first being common law system and the second being civil law system. The, first, the common law system originated in UK and was subsequently adopted by countries such as UK, Malaysia, Singapore. Um, and there's another, uh, and as for the civil law system, this is currently used by many European countries, including France and Germany. And I would say the main difference of common law, the main difference of common law system versus the civil law system is that the common law courts are bound by a systems of precedence. And this means that the similar cases will be treated similarly. And of course, as the law evolves, higher courts can overrule lower courts or some of the case precedent and set a new precedence of reference for future cases. And you will learn all about this when you go into your first year of law later. And as for the civil law system, they are not bound by a system of precedent. And you get to study all these different, um, legal, different legal system and compare the common law system as well as civil law system if you take an optional module in your second or third year called comparative law or if you want to University of Bristol also offers law students the opportunity to study abroad so it depends on whether this is your area of interest and there are two broad categories of law this is my own um I separated it into public law as well as private law. So public law generally deals with anything or any issues that affect the general public or society as a whole. And this includes administrative law, criminal laws. I know uh, quite a few law students get into law because of criminal laws, as well as constitutional laws, which is what I will be talking about later. And as for private law, um, private law usually deals with interactions between private citizens. So for, for example, contract law, tort law, property law, commercial law. And in my next slide, I will show you uh, different sources of law. So how do we know what laws we should follow and who decide what laws a country should follow? And this is known as the institutional sources of English law. Um, for English law, the laws are made by parliament, the laws are made by courts, and English law, English legal system also follows um, international treaties such as the European Convention of Human Rights, as well as uh, retain EU law. So um, the UK recently exited the European Union um, in a process known as a Brexit, but you will still study about retain EU law in your first year of um, law degree. So I hope you're excited about that. And um, usually in a legal writing or when you're looking at cases and trying to understand what the laws are, there are two 
um, general two broad categories of sources of law. The first one being primary sources of law, and this includes legislation, treaties, law reports, also known as case laws, as well as parliamentary papers on certain bills. And as for the secondary sources of law, um, we have opinions maybe by academics, by your lecturers, or by your tutors. We can also have commentaries, you can also refer to journal articles and also discussion. I would say a huge part of my first year focus on interpreting as well as learning how to read these different sources of law. I'm not sure if you guys uh, tried to read uh, case reports. It's, it's, it range, depending on what cases they are, it can range between five pages to 60 pages for just a particular case. So in your first year, don't worry about that because you will learn all about how to pick up the important bits and they will teach you how to critically think, think about a, a case judgment in your first year in the module known as Law in Action. And definitely you'll get better at this. So let's get into the, I would say the interesting part of the, of the lecture, which is the Deb and the Hart case. Um, I wrote Deb v, Deb versus Hurt, but that is, I think that is a US thing. In UK, we just um, address a case as Deb and Hurt. Yeah. So this is a defamation case decided in Fairfax County um, in Virginia, United States. I just want to make a note here that the US and UK, even though they follow the same common law system, but different jurisdictions usually have similar but not exactly the same laws on a particular issue. And in this case, for defamation law, um, UK and US, they have similar but not the same, not the exact same laws. But I thought was, this would be a really good case for me to explain about what defamation is and what are the different elements. So in this slide, um, I would you can see a picture of Johnny Depp and the Amber Heard. Hopefully you can tell which one is which. So the summary of the whole legal issues of this case is that Johnny Depp filed a defamation claim of 50 million against Amber Heard for a defamation arising out of the 2018 op-ed, which, which is the picture in the previous slide that I've attached. And it's, the op-ed is titled Amber Heard. I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change. So that's the entire um, op that that Johnny Depp is suing for. And in, in the same trial, Amber Heard countersued Johnny Depp for $100 million in response to Johnny Depp's attorney in another article calling her allegation of sexual violence fake and a hoax last year as well. So you can see that um, when Johnny Depp is suing Amber Heard, Johnny Depp is the claimant because he's making a claim against Amber Heard. And the same things when, when Amber Heard is filing a claim against Johnny Depp, Amber will be the claimant and Johnny Depp will be the defendant. So yeah, let's see how it goes. But before that, um, I'll just quickly go through what, defama um, what is defamation, what the defamation law is in the UK and what is defamation. So basically defamation is a tortious act in which a third party communicates certain expressions about a certain party that can lead to reputational damage of that particular individual or party. And what is what does it mean by a tortious act? So a tort is basically a law of non-criminal wrongs. And a tortious act can be known as a wrongful act, which caused someone to suffer an unwarranted harm or lead to um, the, an interference with a particular individual's right. And in this case, why do we have defamation law in the first place? And if you are interested in law and you have been reading about freedom of expression of, um, or right to free speech or right to privacy, defamation law is, is an area of tort law where two fundamental constitutional rights intersect with one another. So the two rights being Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights, I'll just shorten it to 
ECHR, namely the right to free speech or the freedom, um, a right to the freedom of expression, as well as someone's right to reputation, which is enshrined in the Article 8 of the ECHR. So both common law as well as ECHR aim to protect our own right to reputation from improper injuries. But at the same time, we do have to remember that we all have freedom of expression as well as um, right to free speech and to what levels that is determined by different countries. Different countries have different definition of what right to free speech amounts to. So what happens when these two rights are in conflict with each other? So um, the Human Rights Act 1998 said that if we have two convention rights that are in conflict with each other, especially qualified rights, qualified rights means that um, there are a certain limits to that right. So if it's an absolute right, such as right to life, that is um, non-negotiable, you have total right to free, uh, total right to life. But in the case of um, right to privacy, that is a qualified right. The court must give greater weight to free speech rather than to right to privacy or right to reputation. So yeah, that is noted down in the section 12 of the Human, right, Human Rights Act 1998. So the balance between the right to reputation and the freedom of expression has been adjusted post the Human Rights Act 1988 to strike a fair balance between the two, especially when they are in conflict with one another. And for UK specifically, we have this, um, the Defamation Act 2013 has been implemented just to uh, set out the different laws and set out the different defamation laws uh, set out the laws that governs defamation cases. However, it is important to, later you will see that pre-2013 case laws and most of the cases that I will use later, they are pre-2013. They are still very important in understanding the central concepts of defamation law, which has been developed over decades, over centuries. And here is the um, different elements for a successful defamation case. So for law, at least in first year, I found that it is a lot of checklists. So in this case for defamation, there is different elements that you have to fulfill and different elements that you have to prove in order um, for a defamation case to success, succeed. So there are four main requirement elements. I'll just go through them with you right now. So firstly, the statement must refer to the claimant either implicitly or explicitly. And in the Johnny Depp case, you, you will notice that in the whole entire article, there is no explicit mention of Johnny Depp's name, but the court has established or the jury has established that the article implicitly refers to Johnny Depp. And secondly, the statement must be published as as per section one, subsection one of the Defamation Act 2013. So the publish meaning that it has to be communicated with another person to have the potential to damage their rights to reputation. And this is demonstrated by the case of Pullman and Water Hill and Company, which is an 1891 case. And you will see that I don't necessarily don't necessarily remember the facts of every cases, but I remember the judgments. And this is what your, uh, your law tutors will tell you. You don't necessarily have to remember the facts of the case, but you do have to um, remember the key bits of the judgments. And thirdly, the statement must be defamatory. So what does it mean by defamatory? The section one, subsection one of the Defamation Act will tell you a statement will be defamatory if it has caused or it is likely to cause serious harm to the reputation of the claimant. And this is known as the serious harm requirement. So in La Show um, and Independent Print, a 2019 case, it said that the finding that serious harm had been proved was based on a combination of the meaning of the words, the situation of the claimant, the circumstances of the publication. So the interpretation of the serious harm is based on evidence and the court will attach uh, or the claimant has to, has to prove a certain accusation of guilt 
uh, when it comes to interpreting the serious harm. So for example, if the court decided that the accusation of guilt is at chase level one, it is known as chase level because the, the case that established this accusation of guilt is the case of Chase and News, News Group Newspaper Limited. So if the court decided that, okay, this statement, um, when a reader is reading this statement, it can be interpreted as the claimant is guilty of the act. Or Chase Level 2, uh, if a reader is reading this statement, it can be interpreted as there is reasonable ground to suspect that the claimant is guilty of the act. Or Chase Level 3, there is a grounds to investigate whether the claimant has committed the act. So depending on the different chase level, it will affect the defendant's ability to use certain defense. So this leads to the last requirement or last element, which is that the defendant must not have a defense. So in the Defamation Act, uh, it has listed down what defense can be used. So in Section 2, it is the defense of truth. The, in Section 3, the defendant has to prove that the statement is his honest opinion. And lastly, it has to prove that it is of the public interest to publish this particular statement. And the publish, the, the, um, to determine whether you are successful in using the public interest, uh, we refer to a case known as the Reynolds defense. So the um, in this case, the defendant has to prove that he or she reasonably believed that publishing the statement complained of was in the public interest. So what it means that, okay, so for example, you will, see it in, you will see this in my problem question example later as well, but what it means is that, so if you think that publishing a certain statement is, you reasonably believe that publishing a certain statement is um, important or is in the public interest. So for example, you are a journal journalist and then you are doing um, an investigation or you discovered something about a very important politician and you publish it online and the politician sued you for defamation. So this is one of the public, ad, uh, public I mean, this is one of the defense that you might be able to use if you can prove that or you are publishing this in the public interest. And once you, you have established all of the um, different elements and the court, the court agreed that you have established all of this, what are the um, compensations that you might be able to claim or you might be awarded? So if the article or if the statement has been published, the court might award you damages. So in the case of Johnny Depp, um, he was awarded 10 million in compensatory damages and 5 million in punitive damages. The difference is that for compensatory damages, um, the court is basically uh, awarding the claimant for what he has lost because of that particular article or statement. And punitive da damages is like an act to mark that the defendant has done a wrong. And in for the heart care, for the Amber Heard case, she was awarded two million in compensatory damages and no punitive damage. Uh, so, if the article has not been published yet, you can ask the court for either an interim injunction or final injunction. So, an interim injunction is to prevent someone from publishing something before the legal issue can be resolved. And as for the final injunction, once the legal issue has been resolved, um, you, you might be able to ask the court to issue an injunction or final injunction to the defendant. And this will effectively prevent the whole publication from going ahead forever. So it's like the article just disappeared. They can't, they can't uh, publish it online. And for the judgment, you might be wondering why does Amber Heard get damages as well. This is because in the same trial uh, for Johnny Depp, the jury found that out of three statements that Johnny Depp made a claim against, all three statements were found to be defamatory. However, out of three statements that Amber Heard is making a claim against, the jury only found one, uh, one statement is, one out of three statements is defamatory. So yeah, that's the entire judgment.
of uh, the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard case. And if, if not mistaken, Amber Heard's lawyer has tried to make an appeal against the judgment. I had a quick read earlier, but um, I'm not sure whether it's successful or not. You can read that out. Yeah. So for the UK as well, if you are unsatisfied with a particular, uh, particular court judgment, you can always make an appeal to a higher court and they are there are definitely procedure in place and you will learn all of this in your constitutional rights module next year if you are going to Bristol. So yeah, and for the next slide, I have attached a problem question example on defamation. So you can see how the law school examine you on the knowledge. And I, I really like, I really enjoy doing this problem question because it's like solving a case and it makes me think that I'm an actual lawyer when I'm not. But this is how law school examine you on your legal knowledge and your understanding. And in your exam, this is one type of the exam questions that will come up for you depending on the different module. So I'll just quickly re read out the problem question for you. Jerry is a social media influencer who has shot to fame for stand-up comedy sets on YouTube. And he has millions of fans across the world and has re recently started giving lifestyle advice on social media. And he promotes a healthy lifestyle and millions of his young fans adopt his signature clothing, hairstyles, his range of big salad meals. And he regularly tours comedy clubs in the UK and meeting his fans. And Elaine, one of Jerry's biggest fans was waiting outside a venue for Jerry to come out and sign autographs. And she witnessed several boxes of takeaway food being brought into the venue through a rear entrance. She noticed one set for Jerry on it. So he sneaked in uh, and took photographs of Jerry appearing to eat an unhealthy looking meal. Later that afternoon, Elaine published them on social media along with the hashtag Jerry is a fraud. So in this case, uh, the exam question will probably will usually ask you, you will usually ask you in this case, what advice or um, draft out the advice that you will give Jerry or draft out the advice that you will give Elaine. In this case, I, I think the problem question asked for, uh, ask, um, could you explain the advice or advise Jerry? That, those are the type of questions that probably will come up. So in this case, if it's advice, uh, yeah, advice Jerry. In this case, you are a lawyer for Jerry and Jerry comes to you with this whole situation and asks, oh, I want to sue for defamation. She has ruined my reputation. What can I do in this case? So you will apply your knowledge of the defamation law that uh, we have gone through earlier. Firstly, we will have to determine uh, which statement is Jerry going to complain of? And it's obvious that um, the most reputation destroying statement is Jerry, hashtag Jerry is a fraud. So you will say uh, in this case, the statement hashtag Jerry is a fraud, does this statement refer to the claimant? And obviously it does refer to the claimant because Jerry, um, it explicitly mentioned Jerry name, Jerry's name. And secondly, we go to the second element. So does this statement, is this statement published? So yes, this statement is published on social media. So um, a checklist for that as well. And for the third element, this is where it gets a little bit, you have to use a little bit of your critical thinking skill, but not much. So the, for the third statement, is the statement published defamatory? So you know that for a statement to be defamatory, it must seriously or had it must cause or is likely to cause serious harm to the reputation of the claimant based on the serious harm requirement. So in this case, what would an influencer's reputation consist of? So it is stated that Jerry is a social media influencer. He has millions of fans and millions of fans adopt his signature clothing. So I would personally say that reputation consists of the trustworthiness as a social media influencer because he promotes a healthy lifestyle. And for you to have influence over millions of fans, of course, your fans will have to trust you as a social, social media influencer. 
So I would say a reputation consists of the trustworthiness of a social media influencer. And um, for him, the, defini the definition of having a reputation might be maintaining his influence and attracting new fans. So this is where you can argue your way or argue to argue a way to prove that oh, this statement actually harms his reputation. Or you might argue, a argue for a different way, or this statement does not actually uh, destroy or as does not actually cause serious harm to his reputation. And why? You will have to use your uh, reasoning to establish, okay, why is his reputation not, uh, not seriously harmed in this case? So I would say in law school, it's not about, there's no right or wrong answer. I've been told this many times by my lecturers, there's no right and wrong answer. It just depends on how well you can argue and how, how well you can establish your claim and your argument using the correct application of law. Yeah. So, okay, let's say that for the third requirement, it has been established that, oh, um, this statement, hashtag Jerry is a fraud, has caused serious harm to the, uh, to the, uh, to the claimant, which is Jerry in this case. So does the defendant, Elaine, has any defense in this case? So let's look at the different defenses that Elaine might be able to use. She can argue that uh, the hashtag, the statement hashtag Jerry is a fraud is contains substantial truth, or she can argue that it is her honest opinion, or she can argue that this is in the public interest for her to share. So it depends on how you argue, how you establish your accusation of guilt in the previous, in the previous, um, in the previous element. So, and this will affect the different defenders that we'll be able to use. But generally in defamation case, I always mention the public interest. So in this case, why would it be in the public interest for Jerry, for Elaine to share about Jerry's, um, Jerry's meal? or Jerry's picture. You can say that because he routinely promotes a healthy lifestyle, but he doesn't, and he has lots of influence as stated by millions of his young fans adopt his signature clothing. So it means that it must have, he must have quite a few or quite an important influence over a lot of people. So you can argue that, oh, that is in the public interest to publish that statement. So it just depends on how you, how you phrase your argument and how you uh, prove your argument. Yeah, so I hope that that has been interesting for you to go through. You will go through that a lot in your, in, throughout your law school. So don't worry if you, don't worry if you, um, if you are not doing problem questions now, you have the chance to do so. So yeah, that's the end of the, of my legal part of my presentation. Now I will, quickly share with you about what is the um, law course like at the University of Bristol. So just to quickly go through the prerequisites, or you can scan the QR code on the screen right now, and it will take you to the Bristol law course page. But if you're taking A-levels, the standard offer is A star AA. And if you're taking IB, it's 38 points. And for next year, I'm pretty sure you still have to take your LNET as well. So there is a certain benchmark that University of Bristol requires for your LNET. It varies every year. So I'm not sure um, what is the exact number that I can give you. But from what I have researched, it's typically between 18 out of 42 to 20 something out of 42. Every university has different benchmarks, so I wouldn't give you an exact answer on that, but that is one of the prerequisite. And in first year, you have six mandatory modules. Um, I took criminal law, contract law, tort law, law in action, law and state, and constitutional rights. And in second year, you have three mandatory modules, EU law, land law, and jurisprudence, as well as three optional units that you can choose from a list of different modules and in third year you have one mandatory module being trust uh, you can either choose between dissertation or final year research project 
and you can choose four optional units um, in your third year. And I would say in first year and second year, the exam structure is either open book or coursework. So, so sorry. So for open book, it's typically either PQ questions, meaning problem questions, or essay questions. Pro problem questions is like the one that we've gone through just now for Bristol. I'm not sure about other uni, but yeah, I think most law school will give their students uh, PQs ex exam, but I'm not entirely sure. So yeah, either PQ question, either PQ problem questions or essay questions. And coursework, I would say, is just a long form of essay questions. So for essays, I think you write 1,500 words. And coursework, the one I did in first year is 3,000 words. So not a lot, quite doable, I think. And um, in the next slide, I've listed a few scholarships that um, you might be able to apply to if you're applying for University of Bristol Law course next year. But I think that the application for this year has closed. The first one being the Think Big About, Think Big About Global Justice Undergraduate Scholarships. And this is uh, specifically for international undergraduate students studying law. And the second one is the Think Big Undergraduate Scholarships. And these are for international students applying to study to study undergraduate courses full-time. I think except for medicine, dentistry, and another one I don't quite remember, but if you scan the QR code here, it will take you to the website of the scholarships list as well. So yeah, and now I will share about my first year experience of the law course and my life in UK generally. So let's start with the study, the studying part. Um, in Bristol, your contact hours usually consist of lectures and seminars. Uh, I don't think in my first year, I did all my lectures online. Um, from what I've heard, I'm not sure whether the law school has confirmed this, but it is likely to be online lectures as well. And you'll get to attend in-person seminars. And this typically will translate to six to eight hours of pre-readings um pre-readings before your seminars and i typically have wait okay let me go back a step the six to eight hours reading is per module uh, you have about six to eight hours of readings that you have to do before the seminars and you have you will typically have two to three seminars a week i my timetable was quite okay because i only had two or three classes a week and i only had to go into um, uni for two days. I think the most it was three days out of a week. So that was pretty okay. It means that you have lots of time for your uh, self-studying, but make sure you don't fall behind. I got sick quite a lot in UK, so I fall behind quite a lot as well. So yeah, and I attach a photo on the, a few photos on my, on the site, just to let you see what my life is like so that's a sunset pic wait I think that was a sunrise picture and that was a view from my uni hall I was really lucky I got a really big room with I think six to eight windows uh, and also I had a view of the harbor river as well as the sunset every morning so that was great and career-wise there are a lot of non-legal career opportunities such as consulting banking that the career office provides. And the I am aiming to do commercial law. So um, my the resources that I've used is uh, usually commercial law related. So if you're interested in commercial law as well, I can let you know about um, all about commercial law. And we have a lot of societies for commercial law as well as uh, other areas of law, such as environmental law. I think there's an I, IP team as IP law, IP and tech society as well. And there is also FinTech society. And we have, we also have a Bristol Bar Society as well, for those of you who are interested in doing, in becoming a barrister. And the two photos at the site was when I attended 
an international for international law firm in London called Allen and Aubrey. I, as you can see on the picture, I awkwardly posed in front of the London office lobby. And the one on top was when I attended the first year scheme social, which was really fun. And the firm sponsored my uh, travel expenses to UK, I mean to London as well. So that was great. I just realized I didn't introduce myself in the beginning. <laughs> So, okay, so if, um, Jenny, could you go back to the blue slide about, the, about myself? Sorry about that. I skipped I skip, I skip past that for some reason. So yeah, as Jenny mentioned, I will be going into um, my second year of law school at the University of Bristol. Um, I think the slide is like the second slide in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, that's the okay. one. Okay. okay, so yeah, so outside of uni, I'm a student advisor for Bristol Law Clinic. And if you are interested in becoming a student advisor where you work with real clients in Bristol, um, you can volunteer to become that as well in your right right in your first year. You can straight away, even without legal knowledge, you can become a student advisor if you want to get involved as early as possible. And I'm also the events officer for the Bristol University Sustainability Network and also the events co coordinator for Bristol Hub. So I will be doing a lot of events next year. So if you are going to Bristol, you can you might see me at those events. And I'm also the 2022 or I'm lucky I'm lucky enough to be chosen as a brand ambassador for Ellen and Ovi. And this is an international law firm in uh it's headquartered in London, but it has offices more than over, I think office 40 plus offices around the world in US, Middle East, Asia. Uh so yeah, that is an experience. Like visiting the law firm was really fun. And I'm I'm also I also play netball with the MSSA team, the Mal Malaysian and Singaporean Student Association at the, Brist at the Bristol University. So yeah, that was really fun. And I will go to the part about mental health and well-being support in University of Bristol. So at University of Bristol, we have dedicated tutors to address any concerns you have, whether it's stress related or you have mitigating circumstances that you want to talk about. In my first year, I had a tutor. I had one personal tutor and also a tutor responsible for the well-being of first year students. And he was really nice about it. And you can just email him if you want to talk about anything. And University of Bristol also has a well-being advisors team. And you can speak to them if you have anything or any worries. So. I thought that they have a lot of resources for well-being support, so I really appreciated that. And if you can see on the long picture, that's the Will's library. It's a very nice library, and I love going there and study. If I, if I ever feel like I'm getting sick of staying in my room, yeah, that's the first place I'll go. It's really nice. And in Bristol, you have lots of cafes that you can study at as well, and. If you can see on the top right corner, um, that was when I went to Manchester Games with the MSS and netball team. And below, that's the Ferris wheel at Bristol Harbour site. And I also went traveling a lot during Italy during summer because the flights are really cheap from UK to Europe. So yeah, it was, it's really fun. And I thought it would be good to give you an overview of my general day in the life um in first year so because I don't have any classes until like 10 in the morning um I only had one 9 a.m seminars so that was great uh typically I wake up and I go to the gym the U Bristol has their Bristol uni has their own gym but there are a lot of gyms around Bristol as well if you if you like to go to the gym I guess and after that depending on whether I have seminars I will either prep for seminars or I will attend seminars or I will do some readings so that's generally from nine to five that's my schedule from nine to five and from five to at night I will generally not do anything that is law related I will just go to um, society stuff hang out with my friends 
netball. Uh, sometimes I will have to submit applications to law firms. So yeah, that's when I would usually do my um, law firm stuff uh, in at night. So yeah, I thought that would be helpful for you guys to know about if you are thinking of going to Bristol University. The workload is okay if you don't fall behind because I fell behind quite a few times. I had to spend a few nights catching up to my studies and that was not fun. And in the next slide, I have compiled a list of resources that I thought it might be helpful for you guys who are interested in a legal career. The one I would like to highlight is the Forage. So it's basically a website that provides you with free virtual work experience to let you see what um, UK law firms are like and what lawyers do in UK. So generally, huge law firms like um, Clifford Chance, Ellen and Overy. I'm not sure Ellen and Overy has virtual work experience on there, but Clifford Chance, Herbert Smith, Three Hills, they post their work experience on there. And if you'd like to see what working in law is like, I would definitely recommend you uh, doing one of one or two of the virtual work experience. It's self-paced as well, so you don't have to worry about um, time pressure. So yeah, and for the next slide, I have compiled a list of useful contacts for you to contact if you have any questions about um, about anything that is related, whether it's related to Uni of Bristol, about law course or about accommodation. These are some of the useful contacts. And I have listed the email of the Southeast Asia office, um, their Instagram as well as their YouTube channel. I remember I I remember emailing the Southeast Asia office quite often during my before I begin my first year because of like visa like because it was during COVID, so I had a lot of issues with the visa, with accommodation, and I just emailed the Southeast Asia office, and they replied me within thirty minutes. So that was really great, and I, yeah, and that was they were really helpful as well, and they will direct you with like the relevant um department as well if they can't answer your question right away, and if you have any questions that you would like me to answer or you you would like to ask me personally, um. You can either add me on Insta or I can be found on my LinkedIn profile is Cindy Liu and you can ask me any questions. I really don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you guys for joining me or joining us on this uh, lecture. I hope you have a I hope you enjoy your break or if you're going into if you're going to first year of uni as well don't worry about it you'll do fine i'm sure you'll do fine but thank you so much for joining us yeah so um have a great night everyone thank you so much bye